So let's keep going. So on the, uh, for the exam, uh, did we go through the first one, the model building? Forecasting, questions you got to ask. How do you determine the dependent, independent variables? How many variables should be in the model? How do you test model significance, T and Fs? Um, how do you get rid of multicollinearity? Keep the one that's been cited the most in the literature. Okay. Internal validity, you get internal die off on your model. You back test it, forward test it. And if it works, you make policy recommendations and you get a promotion. Right? You did it right. And then external validity, you're going to uh, look at industry research reports and you're going to look at peer reviewed journal articles that make up the literature that basically make up the theory. That su supports your model, supports the, uh, the variables in which you chose. You're going to have to do that. Okay? If you haven't done it already, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to defend yourself in front of the board at some point. And then unorthodox monetary policy, uh, the Fed's balance sheet and the reserves are the same at uh, 4.7 trillion currently, not as high as 5.3 trillion right after the financial crisis, and then the Fed unwound its balance sheet and started selling off a lot of the securities. That's one of the reasons why we're in some problems now is the Fed was selling off a lot of their <coughs> short-term bonds and basically inverted the yield curve and you know, kind of got us into trouble. Um, the balance sheet uh, prior to 2007 uh, was between 250 and 800 billion, so an average of 500 uh, billion. Uh, the money supply growth rate in 2008-9 was 30 to 40 percent, and now it's running around 5 to 8 percent, so it's really slowed down, and I think that's one of the reasons why the Fed hasn't been able to hit its inflation targets of 2 percent and its GDP targets of 3 percent. Okay, so it's not growing the money supply fast enough. Um, it hasn't hit its GDP targets. Over the last 10 years, it's been around 1.5, 1.7. It was at 3 in the first quarter in last year, but it's slowed to around 1.7% uh, currently, and the forecast is it for it to decelerate even faster throughout the rest of the year to about 1.5, 1.2, and some people are saying that GDP could grow around 1% next year. So unless the Fed steps on the pedal, you know, pedal to the metal, on the money supply, we can go into a recession uh, next year or definitely 2001. Uh, they've exceeded their unemployment targets, which is at 3.7. They were targeting 5. <coughs> the uh, consumer price index has been averaging about, it's actually negative uh, currently. So it actually turned negative, so it's nowhere close to the 2% that the Fed is trying to target. And if we fell into a recession, yes, we would go into negative interest rates. Everybody's talking about it. President's talking it up. Um, Jerome Powell doesn't want to admit it. But Janet Yellen, uh, Ben Bernanke, and Alan Greenspan, who were prior chairs of the Fed, said yes, we would go into negative interest rates uh, if we went into a recession because interest rates are already so low. It's like you can't, you got to go negative to get the stimulus. Um, it would be stimulative in the short run for the economy as it reduces the cost of capital. Um, and probably over the medium term or the long run, it would probably have a negative effect on just look at Europe. Um, and then would prop up asset prices um, in the medium term, in the short term, and probably have a put downward pressure on, inter, uh, on asset prices in the medium and the long term, unless the Fed wants to pump money into the system forever to prop up the prices. But most central banks aren't willing to do that. So at some point, uh, the bubble in real estate, the bubble in stocks and bonds will probably pop at some point in the near future. It's been 10 years. Savers. Um, uh, right, it's just a horrible situation for savers because they have to buy these bonds at negative interest rates. Um, they're not really getting any coupon interest and they're overpaying for the bonds. So it's just a forced, they're forcing them into lowering their standards of living. So it's awful. Just ask the Japanese and ask some of the European countries. Um, ask those savers how it feels to be in a negative interest rate environment. It's awful. Um, it's probably good for investors if you're lucky enough to invest and own investable financial and real assets. It'll probably benefit them in the short run, but in the medium and long term, at some point in time, the cash flows will be affected as you go into a recession and that'll put down the pressure 
on asset prices. And it will benefit businesses in the short run as their cost of capital is being driven down um, and as the economy is stimulated in the short run. But in the long run, negative interest rates will affect um, the overall economy because people don't have as much interest income to consume and buy stuff. Um, and it will eventually hit the top line uh, revenue growth numbers for, for companies. Uh, dynamic yield curves, um, the Fisher equation. Remember, nominal interest rates are determined using the Fisher equation, which is the real rate plus inflation expectations. Uh, there are three types of yield curves. There's a normal curve, and under the Fisher equation, and a normal upward sloping curve test question, um, what would be inflation expectations? Positive zero or negative with an upward sloping curve? Upward sloping curve. The inflation expectations would be positive. positive. And under a flat curve, the inflation expectations would be zero. zero. And under a inverted curve, inflation expectations would be awesome. What are the four um, yield curve theories? Again, if you took notes, you can just read from your notes. That's the goal of taking notes. Okay. All the best students take really copious notes and they just bam, bam, bam. So what's the first one? Yeah, inflation uh, in expectations hypothesis, thank you. Which is the second one? Preferred habitat. Uh, preferred habitat. Market segmentation. Market segmentation. And liquidity preference. And liquidity preference, awesome. If the yield cur curve shifts up and interest rates go up along the curve, what happens to bond prices? If the yield curve shifts up and interest rates go up, bond prices go. Come on, you guys, sing along. Larry's Finance, sing along. We do at the Castro every well, Friday night, and we do Larry's sing along at the Castro, and it's all around finance. So if the yield curve shifts up and interest rates go up, um, bond prices go. Hello. If interest rates go up and the yield curve shifts up, bond prices go. Hello. If interest rates go up, um, if interest rates go up, bond prices go. If interest rates go up, bond prices go. Up. If interest rates go up, bond prices go down. down. Got it. If interest rates go down, bond prices go up. Uh, got it. See, this is where I drive my students crazy. Is I'll answer the question, ask the question over and over again until I get the right answer. Okay? It drives them freaking nuts. And it shows up every year in my evaluation. Okay. <laughs> so, got it. Uh, does the Fed control and influence? Uh, short-term interest rates directly or indirectly? Does the Fed through open market operations affect mm -hmm. short-term interest rates directly or indirectly? Directly. directly. Um, do they influence long-term interest rates directly or indirectly? Indirectly. indirectly. Got it. Okay. So when the yield curve inverts, when does the S&P 500 peak? Within how many months? When the incur yield curve inverts, the S&P 500 peaks within 12. 12 months. And a recession within 24 months. Got it. Um, did we do the uh, table for these? Did we do the asset class tables? No. OK. So let's do that. So look up the Dow, look up oil, look up gold, look up the treasury yield, look up dollar discount, all of the We'll do the, the table. You guys got to write this down because these are your notes for the exam. 20 pages of notes. It's your goal. Every class, you take 20 pages of notes. You used to take 20 pages of notes. You write everything down. Just put it on the board and write everything down with these things. And then memorize it. All right, so we're doing number D. Okay, and this is out. What it should look like. I'm going to do a table. Asset class. What are the asset classes? CFOs, CEOs, chief investment officers, chief 
Tracking these markets since the beginning of the house because we started to do this stuff earlier. Um, so where's that, where did the Dow Jones settle, you know, almost five and a half hours ago when the market closed on the, <coughs> on the West Coast at 1 o'clock and the 5 o'clock East Coast time? So where's the Dow, what did the Dow Jones settle on? Okay, you're the most powerful generation in the world. You guys have cell phones. We didn't have cell phones in the 90s, the 80s. We didn't have computers in the 90s. Tablets, laptops, and stuff. So you were totally connected to the, to the internet. You have all of the information to be able to give me instantaneous thing. So where did the Dow sell? Possible. Click, 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 click. I like to hear the pitter patter of, uh, of fingers on the keyboard as people start to dig out the information. What did you say? Positive. What was it? Uh, positive 14. No, no, no. Just give me the level first. Where, where did the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Index settle? Where did it settle? It's not up here. It's on your computer. Or on your cell phone. What is it? 26,949.9. Thank you. Okay. Was it up or down? It was up. up. Got it. How much? You want can, you, can you see the, uh, do you have like a week or a two week chart? Uh, so you can see basically the trend. Has it been trending up or trending down? Uh, the five trending days down. down. Yeah. Five days trending down, but recently it's been trending up. Can uh, you give me, I don't care if it's going up or down. In the last month it's gone up. It's gone up over the last month. Can you give me a percentage change or the number of points it's gone up over yeah. the last month? So in the past month it started off at 25,850. Okay. This is August 25th. And now it's at 26,949. So what, like 1,100 or something? Yeah. Like that? So up 1,100 points. And then why is the stock market going up? You got to know why, right? I mean, you guys are going to be owning these stocks. They're going to be in your 401ks, self-directed IRAs. You might be end up trading this stuff. Uh, your grandparents have it. Your parents have it. Everybody has stocks. If you're going to inherit the money, then you might as well know what it is. Go ahead. Just yell it out. Is it because of the interest change? Uh, interest rates actually were going down and actually bottomed down. So falling interest rates, got it. Although interest rates have started to go up, but they have come down and actually reached an all-time low on the 10 year. I think it bottomed at like 1.4 or something. It's at like 1.8 right now. And can you give me another reason why um, the stocks would have gone up over the last month? Are we in a recession? Apple. Oh, oh yeah. Did Apple do pretty good? Yeah. Yeah. And Apple makes up the majority of the uh, stock market indexes. So if Apple does good, good, it brings up everything. Anything else? Are we in a recession? Um, no. Is the economy continuing to grow? Yes. yes. Is it growing faster than most of the other industrialized countries? Yes. Yes, so economic growth. Yes, sir. Um, interest rates also fell. No. Still low? Yeah. Yeah, interest rates are at historical lows, so low interest rates are really good for uh, stock prices. Uh, where's oil trading right now? Where's oil? Go to Yahoo. 58.44. 58.44. And do you have any trend on that? Because it's been pretty volatile, right? What's the supposedly the Houthis or the Iranians basically sent in the drones and took out the major production facilities and 
Saudi Arabia, which caused prices to spike, but they started to come down. So you tell me, you know, going back and looking six months, nine months, one year, whatever, have oil prices been trending up or trending down? Trending up? Yeah, how much? Can we calculate a percentage change or a, uh, with the points? So if it was, if it's at 58.44 and it was trading at 50, how much has it gone up? $8.44, just keep, keep the math easy. Keep us going. So eight dollars and forty-four cents over, and you can write that in over maybe a, a twelve-month period or eighteen-month period, whatever it says there on the graph. And then, what would cause uh, oil prices to go up? Uh, less supply. Okay. Did OPEC cut back? Anything with some cutbacks? And then, is the global economy continuing to grow? Yes, at a slower rate. I mean, the uh, the IMF has revised down their you know growth rate projections, but the probably global economy continues. Global GDP, got it. Where is that gold trading right now per ounce? Eighteen point six zero. What is it? Uh -oh. Gold per ounce. Oh, gold, gold yeah, um, gold per ounce. You guys should be all on your computers. You should be all on your computers digging around and getting this information. 1527. What is it? 1527. 1527. Got it. What's the, uh, what's the trend? Has it been going up or down? Today down. Yeah, but let's, you know, can you go back and look at the three-year chart and tell me if it's been going up. I think when we were, up. yeah, it's been trending up. And I think when we started tracking it in this class, it was basically in a trading range of around 1,200. So it's up almost $400 over the last two years. Can you give me two factors that would drive um, gold prices up? Is the world a happy place to stay these days? Nope. Yes. Nuclear agreements being ripped apart. You know, the Russian nuclear agreement, shh, Iranian, shh, you got Syria, shh, Argentina, shh, you got Istanbul, you got Turkey, you got English is on nuts, basically. So. The number one factor is geopolitical risk. And you have basically countries now that are devaluing their currencies to try to spur um, export growth. And as, as the value of their currencies are devalued and depreciate, the people in the country are freaking out and they start to buy gold to basically preserve their purchasing power by holding gold and not some currency that can be um, inflated away. So devaluation. Valuations, depreciation in the currency. I can't see that under that third number under how much? The third? Uh, that was uh, that was four hundred dollars over two years. So okay. when I was tracking uh, gold per ounce two years ago with my students, it was trading in a range of around twelve hundred per ounce. Didn't do anything for even two years before that. And then over the last twenty-four months, it's gone up like four hundred bucks. It'll probably continue to go up. You know, as we run into political instability around the uh, elections, you know, and Brexit, and Argentina, Brazil. If there's even issues in South Africa, so you tend to look around the world and say, I'd be going into gold. Or the US dollar, or US government bonds as a safe haven. Um, where is the 10 year Treasury yielding right now? 1.7080. So 1.71. Is uh, the 10 year Treasury yield, has it gone up or down? It's gone up in the past month. Okay. 
okay, so it's up. And then do we know, where was it maybe like two or three weeks ago, maybe a month ago? A uh, month ago was at 1.52. 1.52, let's just say 1.51. Gotcha. Just to make the math easy. Okay, everybody needs to write this down and you need to watch this. Okay, you need to watch this. So here's the change. Right, and interest rates, 1.71% minus 1.51%. Uh, when you're talking about fixed income securities like bonds, 1.71% is 171 basis points. 171 basis points. And 1.51% 1, 1 is 151 basis points. So 171 basis points minus 151 basis points gives us what? How many basis points? 20. Okay. 20 basis points. So basically the 10-year treasury yield has increased 20 basis points over the last X number of months. So that's how we talk. So the 10-year treasury yield is up to 1.71%, from 1.51% uh, three weeks ago. It's up 20 basis points. Okay, that's how we say it. And if you go to the uh, event uh, on Wednesday, October 9th, when the top economists come and they start talking about capital markets and yields and stuff, they'll probably start throwing around. When they start talking about the bond market, we'll start talking about percentages and changes in 10-year treasury yields and the number of basis points that they've gone either up or down or up for some period of time. Yeah, because they're analysts. All right, so where, okay. So the yield has gone up, so under the Fisher equation, under the Fisher equation, what would cause interest rates to go up? Using the Fisher equation, what would cause interest rates to go up? Using the Fisher equation, what is it? Higher inflation expectations. Okay. And if interest rates go up, bond prices go down. Yeah. Got it. So if bond prices are going down, are people buying or selling more bonds? Are they buying or selling more bonds? Selling, selling. selling more bonds. Selling. Got it. And if you're selling bonds, what are you buying? You're buying, probably buying stocks. So over the same period, the reason why the stock market is up is probably the same reason why the bond prices are up. And people are selling up bonds going into the stock market because they can get a higher rate of return. And yeah, so are people selling bonds because there's like the interest rates are so low? Okay, uh, well, one is the interest rates are really low on bonds, so it's like, well, I want to get you know, 1.72 when I can get. What did the stock market do over the last, since the beginning of the year? 25%. So 2% or 25%. What do you want? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of volatility in the stock market, but if you want return and you're willing to take over the risk, then you're going to sell off your bonds and buy the stock. And that's what's happening. Okay, excellent. Where is the uh, dollar to the pound, dollar to the euro? So dollar to the pound and dollar to the euro. So what's the dollar to the pound? One point. I know because we did this in class. class. Where's the dollar? How many dollars does it take to buy a pound? One point two four. Yeah, one point two four. Got it. And is that up or down? Over the last two weeks. You can go back and look at the trend and see if you can give me that. Is that up or down? Does it cost me more to buy a pound or less to buy a pound over the last two weeks? Less. It costs us less. So what was it before? One point what? We have some two weeks So what was it two weeks ago? Today's the 23rd, so we make uh, You guys got to be looking this stuff up. On September 9th. 1.21. 1.21? Yeah. Does it cost me more or less to buy a pound? More. More. So did the dollar depreciate or appreciate? Depreciate. Depreciate. Got it. Excellent. And then what about the uh, dollar to the euro? Uh, 
trend? Do you see any trend in the graph? Is it trending up, trending down? It's uh, been trending down. Has it been trending I down? So where was it before? Uh, about a month ago it was 1.108, so about 1 1.2. Or 1.12, yeah. So before it cost me more, right? Now it cost me less. So did the dollar appreciate or depreciate against the euro? Appreciate. 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 So in both, well this here, right, we got an appreciation of the dollar against the euro, we got a depreciation against the dollar over the pound. Okay. So this is that, and this is that. This is probably due to Brexit, right? Like the Brexit has been affecting the exchange rate between the pound and the dollar for, it adds a political component to it, not an economic. And then I'll just do this. So can you tell me why, let's say with the euro, why the dollar would appreciate against the euro and the euro would depreciate against the dollar? Can you tell me what would cause the uh, the dollar to appreciate against the euro? Germany just went into a recession. Huh? Germany just went into a recession. Yeah, it's got negative, negative interest. Negative, not only does Germany have negative interest rate, it also has negative GDP uh, growth rates. Uh, How did they go in the so room? where would you rather be, in the U.S. or in Germany? Here. Yes. Probably be here. So you're going to sell off the euro, and you're going to buy the dollar, and the dollar is going to appreciate against the euro, and the euro is going to depreciate against the dollar. Okay? So those are that's kind of what we're looking for in that. Are you tracking the markets? Do you know where they're trading at? Are they trending up or down? By how much and why? What are the factors? That, and we'll go over the factors over here too. Okay, we'll solidify the, uh, the economic factor analysis so that when you're writing your memos, you understand the factors that are driving the asset class prices up and down. So we're going to go through some basic Marshallian microeconomic supply demand analysis and go through the factors that are going to shift and shock the supply and demand curves back and out and up and down. Okay? And that's what we're going to do right now. So let's go over here. Yes. What was the last one? Oh, this one over here? Yeah. Yeah, and I used the, uh, just the euro. I didn't do the pound. So what would cause the dollar to appreciate against the euro? Um, one reason is that the, that the euro is depreciated against the dollar is because uh, Germany is in a recession. Okay. It's got negative GDP growth rates. And to stimulate the economy, they have been pushing short, medium, and long-term interest rates negative to try to stimulate the economy. And so where would you rather be from an economic arbitrage? Would you be investing in equities, in bonds in Europe, or would you be investing in equities and bonds in the United States? Yeah. We have negative 50 basis points on their 10-year bond. We have 160. 71 uh, basis points that we provide on our 10-year treasury. They're in a recession technically. Uh, we're still growing at around 1.72%. They have negative inflation. Our inflation is still positive. Their unemployment rate is probably around 10 or 12%. Ours is trending at about, ours is around 3.7%. So where would you rather be? So massive capital flows out of Europe and into, into the United States. Okay, so let's do the uh, supply demand analysis and I'm going to walk through this. Okay, and then make sure that I go, I think I have bonds. I have everything for, well, maybe I'll just do all of it. There you go, then that way I won't forget. And then I can go through this. All right. <coughs> So this is going to train you uh, for your metals. Because okay? you've got to come up with the economic factors that are going to drive the prices and or the value of the US dollar up and down. And you've got to think about it in supply and demand terms. So here, obviously, 
home at the ground. I do supply first. I do my supply line. I do my demand line. I basically do my dots all the way down. And I do my dots over here where the supply and demand curve intersect is my equilibrium point at the market clearing price, which is P star. Okay. And down here, this is the quantity supplied. So this is going to be Q, QS star. Okay. So this is where the market's in equilibrium. Then you can shock the system. That will shift the supply curve back. It will cause the quantity to come up. Quantity supplied to shift back and will cause prices to rise. Or you could have the supply curve shift out, the quantity supplied shifts out, and prices fall. Uh, on the demand side, same thing. You have your supply curve, your demand curve in equilibrium, at the equilibrium quantity demanded, star. Equilibrium point there and your market clearing price there. Then you can shock the demand curve up or shock the demand curve down. So those are basically the four scenarios for each of the individual markets. The question is what are the factors that are going to shock the supply curve back or out or the demand curve up or down? Okay. And these are the ones that I could figure out. Maybe when you Continue to do your research over the semester as you continue to do the market research around these major asset classes. You may come up with other factors based on what you're reading. Okay, but these are the stuff that I came up with just based on my background. So the first, what would cause the, for stocks, what would cause the supply curve to shift back, supply to shift, a quantity supply to shift back and prices to rise? Um, what would be stock buybacks? Okay, that's been one of the number one factors that have driven stock prices up over the last 10 years. As the interest rates have gone to basically zero and gone really low, corporations can borrow really cheaply in the bond market, take that money, and basically buy back their stock and drive up their stock price in the process by taking the supply out of the market. It's an accounting gimmick but it's been propping up stock prices over the last 10 years. Okay. Is it artificial? Probably. It's not demand driven, price increases, it's basically accounting, uh, financial engineering to prop up the prices. The other is reverse stock splits, um, which actually allows you to, you know, to split the stock backwards so you're actually, you know, uh, propping up the stock price in the process. This is not a major influence on the marketplace, so I just put it up there because it could be an attribute, but I've never seen it on a macro level have an effect, you know, on stock prices. Um, what would cause the supply curve to shift out uh, for stocks? Uh, one is initial public offerings. As more companies queue up to go public, they do an initial public offering. As more companies queue up to do IPOs and do, up, do IPOs, there may not be enough demand out there for all of the IPOs that are coming to market, so the supply curve will shift down. And that's actually occurring uh, right now. There's a lot of companies, because the stock market's been doing so well, they're all queuing up to do their IPOs before the stock market cracks. So everybody's queuing up to issue their stock at a higher price. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Also, what would shift the supply curve out, quantity supply out, prices to fall? the seasoned and secondary offerings. So these are companies that already are listed on an exchange, their shares already trade on an exchange. Um, what they're doing is they're doing secondary offerings to basically raise more capital at very high stock prices and then use that capital to expand you know, their plant equipment, hire more, more people, expand on a global basis, and take advantages of their comparing advantages uh, on a global basis or on a that's all I came up with. You may have something else. What would cause the demand curve for stocks to shift up? Quantity demanded to shift out and prices to rise. These are what I came up with. Uh, higher earnings, growth rate, expectations. 
the market thinks that earnings growth is going to increase the future, that's going to increase demand for stocks. Uh, the other is low and falling interest rates and inflation. So we're already in a very low interest rate environment. Uh, even though interest rates have gone up, they're still at historical lows. So that means companies can borrow at very low rates and can finance their assets. And people can borrow to basically consume through credit cards and other personal loans and car loans, which stimulates demand for these companies' products. Increases revenues, sales, earnings, and stock prices. Uh, higher economic and employment growth, we already talked about that. And lower geopolitical and economic risk, particularly in the United States. I mean, we're not going to war. We, you know, Canada's not going to invade us. You know, and really Mexico is not going to go to war with us either. So we're pretty isolated as a, as a country and have very low geopolitical risk and economic risk. Although we could talk about some political risks that may be out there, but I'm not going to take this into a political space, of course. Uh, what would cause the demand curve to shift down for stocks, quoting demand to go down and prices to fall? Well, what I do is once you set these up, you can just flip them, flip the logic. So if you get one, you can get the other side. So what would cause the demand for it to fall? Lower earnings growth rate expectations, rising higher interest rates and inflation, lower economic and employment growth, and higher ge geopolitical risk and economic risk. Now, obviously, you can't read that, but that's what it says, and economic risk. So those are the factors that I came up with um, for, the, uh, for the stock market. And if you look at the examples of the memos, and if you're reading any of the literature um, these days on the markets, a lot of these factors are mentioned in the articles. Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Economist, Barron's, Fortune. So let's do the one. What would cause the supply curve to shift back for oil, quantity supply to shift back, and prices to go up? Well, one would be uh, OPEC uh, production cuts. Coordinated, oligopoly, cartel, uh, they all collude and basically say we're going to cut back production, which is going to cause the supply curve to shift back in property prices. Okay. And then uh, this is totally relevant right now, which is supply line disruptions and production disruptions. Uh, the Saudis got their production facilities basically blown up by drones from Yemen or, or Iran. We still don't know yet, uh, but that was extremely disruptive. And then obviously, maybe the Iranians, I don't know, um, basically have been bombing uh, British and um, Saudi tankers coming in and out of the Straits of Hormuz. Okay. So those would also be the most relevant um, supply side shops. Uh, what would cause the um, supply curve to shift out, or the supply to shift out and prices to fall? Uh, OPEC production, increase in production. You could even say peace in the Middle East, particularly through the Straits of Hormuz, uh, would alleviate a lot of those uh, production and supply chain disruptions, but I don't have one. And then fracking. Um, and also the uh, US strategic oil reserve. That's why the price of oil spiked to almost $70 and has come down to roughly $58 today. After the production cuts and the bombings, it spiked to almost $70 and then it came down rapidly. Because the market, the global market is flush with oil um, because of the global economic slowdown. Um, you also have frackers that are continuing in the United States. We export a ton of oil now for the first time ever. That way, and then the president um, basically sold off some oil within our strategic oil reserve to bring the markets back down. Okay, so those would all be factors that would shift the supply curve out. Um, um, would, go ahead. Uh, so, so the president sold some oil reserve to bring yeah. the prices down. How, yep. did, how could that happen? I mean, I just want to know, how did that happen? Well, the, the, the executive branch controls the strategic oil reserve and basically can release oil from the reserve into the open markets at any time strategically. 
to calm the markets and bring oh, oh, the prices I see. down. I see. Yeah, because you know he doesn't want oil prices to go up really right. high, because if they, if they stay really high, you know we're moving into Thanksgiving. It's going right. to cost more to drive around. You know then you know if, if by Christmas time, if oil prices and gas prices are really high, you know Johnny's not getting his you know GI Joe at the come from grip this this Christmas. You know and there's going to be a lot of kids out there that are not going to be happy because they just can't get the you know GI Joe. So it's, uh, you know, th he doesn't want that to happen, so he's going to release some of the money okay. and calm things in. Um, what would cause the demand curve to shift up um, for uh, oil causing demand, quantity demand to increase and prices to rise? Uh, higher economic, higher global economic growth, employment, and population growth. That's what I can say. And then war. Wars is really, it eats up a lot of oil and a lot of gasoline. So if you got wars in, you know, in Kurdistan, you got you know, wars in Syria, you got stuff going on in Egypt now, you got stuff going on in, you know, Iraq, Iran, Israel. I mean, those wars are really expensive. And they eat up a ton of oil. And that could increase the demand for oil if there's uh, wars and political instability on the global basis. Um, what would cause the demand curve um, for oil to shift down, quantity demanded to shift down, and prices to fall? Again, you can just flip it. Right? So technological advancements, electrical, electric cars, alternative renewable energy, uh, lower economic growth, population growth, lower employment, recessions, you know, those are all factors that would contribute. And again, you may come up with other stuff as you're doing your readings. And I do have some financial times over here that I'll hand out to you if you're interested. Um, that talks a lot about this stuff. So let's do gold. Gold's a little bit harder. Um, these are just the things I could come up with. Maybe you can come up with some stuff. Gold would cause the supply curve to shift back, or the supply to shift back, and prices to rise, rise to gold. Treasury and central bank hoarding. Central banks like to hoard their gold to anchor their currencies, to keep their currencies from devaluing. And then, you know, the, the Russians and the Saudis like to hold a lot of gold um, because they can always sell off the gold to get foreign currency to basically uh, pay off their do de dollar denominated liabilities or foreign currency liabilities. So central banks and treasuries like to keep uh, gold um, in their vaults. Uh, that was really the only thing I could, I could think of. What would shift the supply curve out and prices to fall? Well, sell off by central banks and treasuries, and I would even say a sell off by foreign investors. And then technological advancements. If there's new technologies to you know, invent a new binocular to I can look into the ground and find the gold beam and then have like drilling equipment technology advanced that allows me to get to the vein and extract the oil more efficiently, there's going to be more supply. That's all I can think of. Um, what would increase the demand for gold and cause prices to go up? Uh, higher inflation, higher inflation expectations, a depreciation and devaluation in currencies. If your currency is falling, most people go into gold to anchor and to re retain their purchasing power um, by investing in gold. Because it, it, the gold is a good store of wealth as opposed to uh, currencies. Um, also, geopolitical risk. We already talked about higher ge geopolitical risk uh, on a global basis. It's one of the reasons why gold has gone up. Devaluations and higher geopolitical risk. What would cause the demand curve to fall, quantity demanded to fall, and prices to fall for gold? Lower inflation, lower inflation expectations, um, appreciation and revaluation of currencies, and falling and lower geopolitical risk. There may be other stuff, but those are just the top ones that I came up with. And then the next is bonds. What would shift the supply curve back, quantity supply to shift back, and prices for bonds to go up? 
If bond prices go up, interest rates go down. down. Got it. Okay. So these are the things that I came up with that would shift the supply curve back. Fed purchasing the bonds through open market operations. So if the Fed purchased the bonds, bonds are being pulled out of the market and cash is being inject injected into the economy. So the open market operations could shift the curve back. The other is maturing bonds. The majority of bonds have very short-term maturities in between like, three months and three years, the majority of them. So these bonds are expiring, they're reaching the maturity, and if the government doesn't replace those bonds, uh, as those bonds mature, the supply curve is going to shift back. Okay. And then the other is budget surpluses. Very rare event. Uh, only occurred during the Clinton administration and in other periods prior to World War II. Um, if the government is running a budget surplus, um, they don't need to issue any bonds. And actually what they're going to do is take part of that surplus and go back and buy bonds out of the marketplace and expire them. And basically uh, retire them. Okay. The budget surplus. Uh, what would cause the supply curve to shift out for bonds? And if bond prices, if the supply curve shift out, shifts out, then bond prices go, if the supply curve shifts out, Bond prices go up. The supply curve shifts out. You know, quantity supply increases. Bond prices go down, down. and interest rates go up. up. Excellent. So selling off of bonds by the Federal Reserve, I would even say also um, Come on. foreign selling. Foreign investors selling their bonds. Uh, budget deficits. If there's not enough people buying up the budget deficit bonds, a trillion a year for as long as I can see. Um, there's going to be more supply than demand. Quantity supply is going to be more, and that's going to drive bond prices down and interest rates up. Okay. And then extending bond maturities. Actually, Steve Mnuchin, love Steve, love Steve, he's awesome. Uh, Steve in, uh, wants to issue 50-year bonds. They don't have 50-year bonds. The longest maturity bonds we have are 20 and 30 years. He wants to do basically screw over the investors, which is great. So, great. Love Steve. Okay. Um, what would cause the demand curve for bonds to go up? Uh, falling interest rates and falling inflation expectations. And inflation. Okay. So if we see that the economy is going into a recession, inflation is going down, inflation expectations are going down, interest rates are going down, bond prices are going up, demand for bonds are going to go up. Okay. Uh, High interest rates. Uh, we have two, you know, one point seven one percent yielding ten-year treasuries in Germany. It's negative fifty basis points, or a negative half a percentage point. So there's a lot of money coming in from overseas into the U.S. bond market because of higher interest rates. Um, and liquidity preference. People go into government bonds because they like the liquidity. It's the most liquid market, bond market in the world. So when people want liquidity, they put their money in the U.S. government bond market, particularly short-term treasury securities. What would cause the demand curve to fall, quantity demand to fall, prices to fall, and interest rates to go? If bond prices go down, then interest rates go up. Got it. Okay. So what would cause the demand curve to go down, shift down from bonds? Rising interest rates and inflation, low negative interest rates, and less liquidity preference and a preference for more risk. So if the demand curve is shifting down for bonds, people are going into stocks. Okay. When people are scared in the stock market, they go into golden bonds. When people want to get a return and they're willing to take the risk, they sell off the bonds in gold and they go into stocks. And then the last one is the US dollar, the value of the US dollar next to foreign currency or FX. So what would cause the Supply curve to shift back for the U.S. dollar. Well, bond Federal Reserve selling bonds, so they sell the bonds, they're pulling out cash. The supply curve shifts back, and the, and the value of the dollar appreciates. Or when the Federal does this, it's not appreciation; it's called revaluation. When the currency's values drop due to government intervention, it's devaluation. When it's market driven. Valuation decline, it's depreciation. When it's government intervention, 
rising the values in the currency, it's revaluation, and when it's driven by the market, it's appreciation. Okay? So that's the terminology. So this would be revaluation. And remember, uh, on the supply demand graphs, when you're talking about currencies, it's value, not price. Okay? And then what would cause the supply curve to shift out, quantity the supply to shift out, and values to fall? Uh, this would be devaluation. The, the, the Fed buying bonds, so buying the bonds, injecting liquidity and dollars into the system. Fed printing of money, increasing the money supply to devalue the currency, destroy exports, uh, and to sell off by foreign investors. They may go sell off their dollars and go into emerging markets because they think they can get higher rates of return at some point in the emerging market economic cycle. Uh, what would cause the demand curve for uh, dollars uh, to increase, quantity demanded to increase, and the dollar to uh, appreciate? Uh, one would be increased geopolitical risk, higher demand from foreign investors. They want to be here because it's safe, or could be in any place else. This is the flight to safety. They want to be here in the United States. Uh, low inflation rates would shift the demand curve up and cause appreciation, higher interest rates will attract more dollar, more foreign currency, will sell off the foreign currency, buy the dollar, cost the dollar to appreciate, because we have higher interest rates than other countries, and higher expected returns on both the stock market and the real estate market in the United States. What would cause the demand curve to shift down for the dollar, the quantity of demand to shift out and cause the dollar to devalue or depreciate, uh, what would be geopolitical risk, lower geopolitical risk? So they, people are feeling more comfortable in going overseas. Uh, high inflation uh, would deteriorate the purchasing power of the, of the dollar. So people would sell off and go someplace else. Low interest rates. We have low interest rates here. There's no incentive to invest here. Uh, and low return expectations on stocks and real estate. Oh, and the other here is, uh, what would cause the demand curve to shift up? Uh, higher labor productivity rates in the United States compared to other countries and higher corporate profits. Labor productivity is, is a proxy for corporate profits. And then what would cause the demand curve to shift down? Lower labor productivity and lower corporate profits. Corporate profits going like back to the shareholders? Um, I think of corporate profits as labor productivity. You know, what is my revenue or earnings or profits per employee per, okay. due to the deployment of technology? Okay. Right? So I'm more, we're more productive, so we generate more revenue, sales, profits, earnings, which causes our stock prices to be higher because our labor pool is more productive yeah. because we deploy more capital and technology compared to other countries. Okay, how am I doing on time? Uh, 30 minutes. Okay, perfect. I can get this done. All right, so now let's switch gears and do the microeconomic foundations of financial product innovation and engineering. I introduced this lecture uh, into my lectures about seven, eight years ago um, because I realized that finance wasn't finance anymore. Finance is basically, finance is it, financial securities or tools that were financially engineered as products to be sold into the marketplace to basically solve problems. And now with the introduction of FinTech, financial tech companies that build new product and new processes, um, finance is not financial analysis anymore. We're basically financial engineers that design processes and products to basically solve problems. Okay. It's just like inventing the iPhone or any other type of industrial engineering of engineering products. There's no difference between financial service product innovation and manufacturing product innovation. None. The same criteria to create innovative environments for product innovation in financial services companies and industry is exactly the same in technology companies. So the question is, do you understand that? Okay, so here are the criteria for product and process innovation within these companies. And these could be hedge funds. These could be shadow banks. These could be commercial banks. These could be investment banks. Um, these could be uh, fintech companies. 
the process is basically the same. Okay? The first is ongoing environmental scan. All innovative companies constantly and continuously scan the marketplace for changes in the market, for market opportunities, and then pounce on it as quickly as possible through ex execution. Um, the company will identify changes in the market, shifts in the market, or maybe increase competition and pressure because the competition was an early mover within the space and now they have to compete and now they have to shift, innovate, or maybe even restructure the firm. These companies also understand both industrial and industrial individual and group psychologies. Uh, it's industrial psychology. Okay? I see no difference between you know, a two million square foot office building that houses you know, 20, 30, maybe 40,000 people and basically warehousing distribution facilities that manufacture, you know, and maybe distribute product. It's an industrial psychological environment. There's individuals in these environments. There's groups within the environments. And you as managers are going to have to realize that if you're going to manage people, you're going to have to manage them within an industrial environment with all of the psychoses, neuroses, and hopefully not pathological behaviors that manifests within these industrial um, psychological environments. You have to be very careful. You have to understand how people are motivated. You have to understand groupthink and how people within the firm will manipulate other people for their own self-interest and not the self-interest of the customer or the company or the stakeholders and the other employees within the companies. So you have to understand the, the psychology. You also need uh, cultural leadership of charismatic leaders within the company that can be role models and models for other individuals within the companies. Not only to emulate their career tracks, but emulate the precision within their conversations, their communications, their educational background, their, their experiences and their successes in their careers. These people are role models for other people within the company. And other people in the company We'll try to act out and emulate these individuals through by emulating their behaviors through the process of self-efficacy. Some will succeed, some will fail, fail. But in these uh, innovative environments, people don't look at failure as pre genetic predisposition. They look at failure as, as a lack of information and the ability to be persistent to be able to continue on and innovate and bring the product to market. You also need clearly laid out and communicated strategies at the strategic level. You need clearly defined and communicated tactics. And you need uh, clearly communicated operational plans with measurable and achievable met goals, objectives, and metrics. Um, once you have that set up, then you can start the product and process innovation. Um, you need to have. Um, in the product and process innovation stage, you need technology to basically capture all of the internal institutional knowledge within the company. Um, not only to track all of the products and processes that were, innovate, that were innovated, but also as a knowledge base and a human resources and a resource allocation. The system that you use is an ERP or an enterprise resource planning system, an enterprise level planning system. So example, you see a shift in the market, you see an opportunity. You remember three years ago that there was a product and process that we developed three years ago. You go back into the ERP, you go back into the knowledge base, you pull out all the documentation, you reassemble the team with some adjustments to the skill sets, and boom, you can innovate and bring the product to market in probably half or a third of the time because you didn't have to go through it the first time because you have everything basically and accessible. Um, to product and process innovate, you've got to recognize the needs and the wants of the market. You've got to understand your clients. What do they need and what do they want? Then you need to develop the products um, on an ongoing basis through your research and development arm. You have to have an in-place R&D or a financial engineering group within your financial services firm that is constantly testing new products to bring to the marketplace and to solve problems for the clients. 
We also need to design your products with the attributes that are going to solve the problems to the marketplace for the individual. For example, in 2010, when I went to go work for New York Life uh, down in San Jose, there was clients out there and prospects out there that were screaming to the company, we need guaranteed products. We want guaranteed annuities. I just lost 40 to 50% of my net wealth through the decline in the stock market. I'm now going to have to work another 10 years to recoup that money. I want you to develop guaranteed products so I never lose any money, particularly the principal that I put in, and I want to give you the money so that when I turn 70, that you will pay me a guaranteed annuity payout for the rest of my life so I never run out of money. And New York Life brought those products to market in nine months. A 167-year-old company brought the products to market in nine months and captured the majority of the market within that time period. Their market share is degraded to around 40%, but they still dominate the market in guaranteed annuity products. Freaking brilliant. Brilliant. Um, next, product and production manufacturing and distribution. Once you figure it out, design the product, standardize it, you can then manufacture it and distribute it through your distribution channels. And there's going to be a distribution channel mix. If you don't have an existing distribution channel, you're going to have to either buy it or build it to get it, to be able to distribute the products. That's what a lot of financial services firms are doing right now. Is they're buying fintech companies and they're buying other managers and other distribution channels that they don't have currently existed. They're either going to buy it or they're going to build it. And you got to figure out uh, which one's better. Um, you're going to have to figure out the channel distribution. What are the channels in which you're going to distribute the products? What are the networks of these distribution channels? And what's the optimal mix of the distribution channel to maximize the revenue? You're also going to have to um, identify your supplier chain networks. You're going to have to also optimize the mix of your supplier chains that are going to be inputting into you the manufacturing of these products. Um, so you're going to have to optimize the supply chain networks also. Once you've done that, then you can start moving into business development, marketing, and sales. Uh, to do that, you have to have a marketing research department that's constantly doing the research to basically identify the segments of the marketplace that are stratified by either psychographics, demographics, or business economic segments. So it's going to be completely different to market to me, a baby boomer, you know, post, you know, hippie dude, um, compared to a hipster, yipster, you know, millennial. It's going to be two different types of products and two different types of marketing campaigns that we're going to do. Um, so you need to be able to, from the research, segmentation analysis, Identify the target markets that you're going to sell into and identify them by demographic, psychographic demographics and business segments. Maybe it's different businesses by economic sector or by size. Large cap companies, mid cap companies, or maybe startups, small caps. What are you targeting? And you're going to have to change the messaging, right? Your advertising campaigns and your messaging, depending on who you're targeting to sell into to generate the revenues. So you're going to have to optimize your advertising mix. How much is radio? How much is TV? How much is social media? How much is billboards? How much is, you know, you gotta figure all that stuff out. And which one works for the different segmentations of the segments of your market. What's the goal in the financial services industry? It's generating fees, okay? We want asset center management. We wanna accumulate as much asset center management and charge a fee. We also want to design products and sell those products so we can earn a commission. Okay, so there's fee-based on the asset center management and there's product sales based revenues that we can generate. And when you do the advertising, you're basically client prospecting. Now the company can do it on your behalf, which is going to drive traffic to you and then you're going to field the calls, set up the meetings, get in front of the client, present yourself, gather the information, Go back, do the analysis, go back, make the presentation, and hopefully you can get the person to sell, to buy. Okay? Yes? What is, what is AUM? Assets under management. That's our goal. Okay? 
once I get my prospects, I go through that whole sales cycle, because financial services suck, because you've got to go through like multiple stages of the sales cycle to get somebody to actually buy from you. And nine times out of 10, I've gotten all the way in, and I'm actually signing, so like sign right here, sign here, and the person says, no, I'm not gonna buy from you. It's like, why? It's like, well, my brother told me I should. And he's in the, he's in the business too. And my aunt's in the business, and my sister's in the business. So they basically, you do all the work and they basically yank it from you because of the freaking brother it takes you out in the end. Um, but once you get the prospects and you, get, and you do a sale, you got them locked in. And now you can cross sell products to them, you can upsell products to them. And once you got them locked in and they're your client, you can get recurring revenue from them. You can get recurring revenue. And the goal is, as you do your prospecting, is how long does it take for me to convert my client to a client, the prospect to a client? Can I accelerate the sales cycle, create velocity in the sales cycle? Not only increase the sales cycle, but also scale the sales. So it takes me just as much time to write 10 $1 million life insurance policies as it would take me to write 10, $10 million life insurance policies. So over time, you're trying to increase the velocity of sale and increase the scale of the sale. And you go to the enterprise level. Does that um, increase the fees? Is that what? Huh? Does that increase the fees? It increases revenue, commissions, uh, bonuses, salaries. I mean, it increases everything. Okay. This is all best practices. I'm not making any. And then the last part is customer feedback and customer service. Okay, you, need, you need a CRM, a customer relationship management system, to basically manage your client base, because before you know it, you're going to have 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 clients. And you need the technology to be able to do that. Through interactions with the clients, quarterly, biannual, annual reviews, communications on a constant basis, they're going to be telling you what products they want with the attributes that are gonna solve their problem. And that basically feeds back right into the production process and innovation stage again. So it's a circular loop. Okay. How much time do I got? Uh, 15, 15. Perfect. There are two models that are used in industry. Um, you may have been exposed to this uh, in your operations research class or in your marketing class. Finance is just marketing. That's all it is. We design products, and we basically design them, standardize them, bring them to market, sell them to the clients, solve problems, do it again. Okay. Could be cell phones, could be stocks, could be derivative contracts, could be risk management strategies, could be um, enterprise level risk management, technology, software, applications, so the first theory is the S-curve. Okay? This is from the operations research literature. And it basically states that you have time, versus over time, companies will develop technologies. And these technologies are little S-curves, like S's, like that. And the S's are contiguous to each other. Okay? So successful companies, Salesforce, Oracle, Intel, Apple, you name it, you know, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, you name it, basically invent technology to consistently, contiguous over time. And that basically, based on that track record, the market looks at these companies and says, these companies have de developed technology successfully over time, they're gonna continue to do it into the future forever. So what this does, these continuous technology curves creates this green line, which is called a revenue growth path, a revenue growth path, which basically means that the market thinks that these companies will continue to innovate new technologies continuously, consistently, forever, over time. Okay. Technologies as in like products? Uh, chips, oh, okay. processes. Hardware. Uh, could be hardware, could be software, could be project management, 
processes, uh, could be any type of technology. So there's like a direct correlation? With direct correlation between successful companies that have been able to innovate and bring new technologies consistently, uh, continuously over time. So the assumption is, and this is what the market sees, is that the cash flows from the company out into infinity. This is the Gordon growth ball. So this is the enterprise level, enterprise value of the company. The market says, okay, cash flows into the future are gonna grow at a maximum rate forever. Well, if the growth rate is maximized, then the value of the company is maximized. So the firms that can consecutively innovate new technologies consistently over time will see the enterprise value or their stock price maximized at all time, okay? If they can communicate that to the market and if the market recognizes that, okay? The second theory of enterprise value is the product adoption cycle taken from the marketing literature. So all products, financial products, physical products, electronic products, you name it, go through different stages of product adoption. So when we introduce a product initially, uh, it's only the innovators, the innovator stage, the early, early adopters that are adopting the product. Well now, now because of social media and the ability to basically distribute and communicate with millions or billions of people if you're Twitter and you know, Facebook, you're able to actually get into the early majority adoption phase a lot quicker than ever before in history. And once you get into this hockey stick phase, your revenues, your profits, and your sales are increasing rapidly. And in some cases, they go vertical. Usually the uh, founders of the companies are here. And most founders of the companies very rarely, except for maybe Zuckerberg and others, are able to transition from managing the company in their innovator stage into the early majority adoption phase do scale, you know, be able to scale their company rapidly and get into majority adoption very quickly. I would say Facebook is already in majority adoption or maybe actually in a late majority and maybe even laggard stage. That's why if you look at Google and Facebook and a lot of those companies, that's why they're buying YouTube and you know, Snapchat and all these companies because they're trying to continue to grow and add new products and services to their portfolio product mix. So with yeah, like Steve Jobs skipped some of those steps because he left the company then came back? Well, Steve Jobs actually went and did Pixar and mm -hmm. other companies too. So, so he was developing new products. Mm -hmm. So he would do Apple, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the computer, the iPad, all that stuff. But then he went off and did Pixar. Mm -hmm. So he did another product through mm -hmm. the adoption cycle. Mm -hmm. And then he was doing what, you know, uh, music and media and entertainment, creating more product adoption cycles, right? Creating an upward revenue growth path to basically maximize the growth rate of the cash flows into forever, maximizing the value of the firm. Would you say Apple has maximized the value currently? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everybody understands the same, it's the same for Goldman, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, you know, B of A, Wells Fargo, the FinTech companies, hedge funds, shadow banks. I mean, the finance industry now is being revolutionized changing extremely rapidly and it's you can't it doesn't even look the same anymore over the last 24 to 36 months so these courses have to be designed and taught differently um, the last two steps are to when we launch these products it's like okay we, we need to innovate and start you know you know developing these products it's going to cost money to develop these products for innovation to test them to get them out there so you're going to have to do financial feasibility analysis, which is what you're going to do in the second part of this class, is you're going to be studying capital budgeting and how do you project out the revenues and discount them back to the present to calculate the present value, to subtract out the cost of development, to get the net present value. And if the net present value is positive, we say, yes, we're going to do it. If the internal rate of return is greater than our weighted average cost of capital, we're going to do it. And if the break-even is less than a year, we're going to do it. So we're going to use 
capital budgeting and financial decision making tools that you're learning in this class to make those product innovation and product uh, deployment decisions. Um, the last step is companies, really good companies, basically have a checklist of, you know, what, are, what is the criteria that needs to be met for us to enter the market? Check, 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 we're going in. Um, same thing on exit, when they're exiting, uh, they're exiting the market. Check, 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 check. If we're gonna exit, we're gonna take those products and services within that division, and we gotta figure out, does that product services division add more value to the overall enterprise value of the company, or is the entity more value if we spin it out as an initial public offering and take it public and create a capital event? So you have to make that decision. So it's gotta be rules-based, and you gotta be able to execute, not only on your entrance decision, and when you exit, you've got to be decisive in your execution. If you're not, your project's probably going to, product's going to fail, or it's going to be extremely costly and the returns are going to be low. You've got to be able to develop clear metrics and benchmarks for decision-making purposes. And lastly, you need to be able to make decisive decisions. That's why you're here. Okay? That's why you're spending four years and two years to get a 3.6, 3.8, 4.0 in the last two years of your business school. So that when you are confronted with these types of opportunities, that you can make decisive decisions along with your peers, your leadership group, and know that the decisions that you're making are correct and do it decisively. Okay, that's it. That's all I got. And I'll do the rest of it um, on Thursday.